and it isn't crazy one thing i, I do want to say like this is going to be maybe controversial but like it is not crazy for people who are ceos and leaders for the organization to serve at their pleasure to make them more effective and better that's not a crazy thing like it's all oh the team and like I, i'm all about team and growing other people but but as the leader sometimes it is important that Maybe the team's a little bit un- less productive for your benefit because you're ultimately the only person who can see everything that's happening and you're ultimately making most of the decisions, right? And so it's not a crazy thing for people to have to do things. Like a lot of CEOs, they don't want to impose, oh, I don't need you to send me a report. That's going to take you time. Maybe you do. Maybe 10 minutes of you reading something is worth it versus you poking around in Google Analytics. What's up, everyone? I'm Alex Lieberman. Yo, this is Jesse Puji. And this is The Crazy Ones. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of The Crazy Ones, the best startup show on planet Earth. We are back and we are excited to do this thing. Before we hop into the episode, I need to give a shout out to a few listeners. Jesse and I have been bombarded with emails over the last few weeks. We've gotten hundreds of them. So if you don't hear your name right now, just know we have gotten your email and we are going to get back to it. But just a few call outs. Eliza S., who's in the process of launching a new app. Thanks for emailing us, Eliza, and good luck with the business. Jackson F., who is the founder of Edily Learning. Uh, they are building an ed tech platform for the creator economy. Thanks for writing in. And Erica P., who has been in performance marketing since 1999. I was a six-year-old. I was playing with Pokemon cards. And she <laughs> is crushing it running Playbook Media. Thank you guys so much for emailing us. And if you want to get a shout out on the podcast, shoot us an email saying hi, literally two letters, hi, H-I, to the crazy ones at morningbrew.com. It'll take 15 seconds to send that email and you will get featured possibly in front of hundreds of thousands of people. Jesse, and you ready to do this thing? We're not against five-star reviews and sharing it with your friends and family either. So feel free Yeah, to the only that. thing we're against is three-star reviews or four-star reviews or one-star reviews. But yeah, if you want to give us a great review or tell us uh, or tell a friend about us, we are always down for that. Um, I love this phrase that you gave me last time that you do with your family, high, low, buffalo. Uh, I still don't know what Buffalo means, but we're going to roll with it. So what's your high, low Buffalo from the last week? Ooh, uh, high was, I sent, I sent you text. I took my kids to the first, their first NHL game last night. Yeah. And I don't know if I, like, I don't know if I remember them being more boring when I was a kid or if they've actually gotten better. Dude, they are the best. They're so entertaining. I mean, the last four minutes of like one of the intermissions, they started playing the weekend song, Blinded Lights. And like, yep. it, just the whole thing was so well produced and so exciting and my we had to drag my son out we left out the second period it was his boy scouts game so he had some boy scout friends still there but like uh it was just amazing and we were i, I mean, think, you, the worst seats you could have in the stadium and it was perfect like it, i was gonna it say was, i don't think there was anyone in that stadium was that was having a better time than your son you sent me the video of just like him having a blast and like it that he just looked like he was exactly where he wanted to be for yeah. the, those two hours it's so cool but and also like his my wife's dad is a huge hockey fan like he'll come to st louis and he does he has some business here and he'll like just go by himself to nhl hockey games and yep. so i'm really pumped that he they're gonna get to start going to games together now like he's of age uh so anyway that's a high by the way a hill a hill i will die on is that uh in per, a hockey in person is the best in-person sport of any major sport um and if you disagree with me I will disagree with you because uh, I've been to all four major sports and hockey is the best in person. Okay, let's hear the low. Uh, low, I think a minor low is like a, the weather's getting nicer here where the allergies are coming. And so that's been hitting me pretty hard. I think in general, I'm, I'm having one of those weeks where I just feel stretched. You know, it's like I talk about zone of genius and all those things, which I generally do a good job of staying in. But this has been one of those weeks where I feel like I'm not in my zone of like, but yet I need to, yeah, I got to run this meeting or this thing needs to get to take place. What do you do uh, when you feel like that? Is there anything you do to try to recenter yourself? Yeah, I, I try to go to gratitude. That's probably like the thing I've been doing the last couple of days is just like being in gratitude. I mean, there's always there's the behaviors of like heroing oneself, which is like, oh, it's fine. Just, deal, just suck it up and deal with it. There's the thing of like, oh, I don't want to feel like this and like fighting that. Uh, sometimes it's like, no, this is where this is where we are right now. That's okay. Uh, but I try I try to have gratitude. And then and then if it gets too intense, like I make changes, you know, I, I yeah. That's a big one, I think. And that's uh, some of the things I want to talk about with the meetings that we were, uh, we'll talk about later today. And then Buffalo. Buffalo is a fun one. So 
the you know uh carolyn who's my p- partner with unbloat she's the ceo uh you know she i acknowledge her she's maybe I've, I've made her slash she's learned facebook ads like how to run them herself like she had an agency she, i said you know what this is never going to work if you don't actually learn fingers to keys I, like i want you to upload them and part of the reason for that early on is the space between your brain and then something getting out into the world is is zero versus like even if you have an employee or an agency like, you know, and so most of the time I talk about delegating and whatever, at certain times it's important to actually learn the basics yourself, right? And do it. And so then we'll talk every week and we'll be like, oh, there's, she's like, oh, this ad's performing a little better. Uh, this ad's not performing that great. And at one point I had to stop her. I said, Carolyn, if something is 10 or 20% better, it's not actually better. Like it's not a champion. It's just another iterative sort of like incremental ad. And, you know, she's never experienced this. And I think you probably have with the brew. I've, I have a million times. I was like, when we have a winner, like a real champion that's taking off, we, there will not be any discussion or debate or wondering whether or not it's a winner. And so this morning she texts me and typically our ads have like a $40 CPM and a cost per click of like $4, something like that. And like a 1% click through rate roughly. We have an ad now that's got fourteen dollars CPMs, oh two and a half God. percent click click uh, click through rate, and sixty cents CPCs, and wow. she's just like, and it's like a double. It's exciting for the business, of course, but it's like just really. I told her I was like, you're never going to be the same. Like when you had that moment, you were never going to be the same because you felt it's kind of like the first time your business works or makes. It's like you taste it, and it's like man, and so that's it was very oh, buffalo-y. Because it came out of nowhere and, and sort of just random, but it happened, and, and I'm really excited about that. Uh, so we'll talk about in four months from now when this creative is no longer working, what the creative is. But are there any lessons from what is working right now that could be applied to as people are doing paid marketing for their ads for their businesses? Like general principles that are working, why this may be working well. Yeah, I mean, in, in this case, it's interesting, right? I, I have such a big network of people who work for me who are running growth at brands. And so... She sent me an ad and I like, oh, I know the guy who runs growth there. He worked for me. And so I texted him with her on the thread and we started going back and forth. And he just like, hey, this thing worked really well for us. Try it. So I think one general principle is like talk to a lot of people, like, you know, getting out there and talking and sort of like having the conversation, seeing what's working for other people is probably one really hacky, easy way to figure it out. Totally. I think the other one is like, it t- you know, for every, and we were talking about this with with Twitter threads and stuff, like for every 10 things you do or write or put out, like one is going to probably get hit or published. And so you really have to have that volley. You have to have people that you volley with. You go back and forth with them. We'll talk about that with the meetings and stuff in a second. But, um, and then, yeah, I think like you got to keep experimenting with different things, I think. And, and like, I like, I think Barry Holt says it. He's like, don't say the algorithm, say the audience. Cause like the algorithm is very like sort of blamey, like, oh, the algorithm's not working. It's like, no, actually <laughs> yeah. what you're saying, the audience is not finding interesting or compelling. And so hundred percent. But, but we, can talk, the, we have a whole episode about this. Totally. It's funny. The algorithm comment makes me think about there's so many people I've been seeing on Twitter recently saying that like they're not getting enough reach on Twitter. They're not getting in front of their audience anymore. And they're like kind of like hate tweeting about Twitter. But yeah, to your point, if you create the right stuff, you will always find audience. Um, and just one point on what you said about like talking to people who have done growth for a while. I feel like the number one hack when we were starting the brew and even like what we do today and what I've been doing for the plunge is you just like copy and remix people. Like how was I thinking about what creative I should run for the plunge for the backyard game? I just looked at every other backyard game out there. What are the ad sets that they're currently running? And I, at least half of my ads that I'm running right now on Facebook are just directly informed by that. Yeah, and I think the other big thing too that here's another good general principle. I see this mistake a lot is, and, and not just for Facebook ads, but literally every part of business is like when you see signal. The, I gave I gave Carolyn an analogy this morning because she she saw the signal and then she was like, oh, I, I want to test some other things. I go, hold on, no, 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 no. What you just told me is that you were you were poking a, a thing in the ground and oil started to sputter from one of them. You don't go and poke the 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 stick in other parts yeah. of the ground at that point. You start, you start that digging point, into that hole. You dig into that hole. You put up <laughs> an oil rig. You start, you know, like, and then, yeah. yeah, of course, the oil of that, that will get be done one day. And sure, once that's pumping out oil consistently, then maybe go test others. But there is a common thing I see with a lot of entrepreneurs that they'll start to see signal 
And then they'll just kind of keep doing what they were doing already. Like whatever their game plan was at the beginning of the week, I go, I like Carolyn, stop the presses. This changes everything. Like this, everything you thought you were doing, you're no longer doing that anymore. You're totally, you're going to keep digging into this hole until we figure out that they're there. But I think it's just a very common inertia related challenge that you see people have. And so anyway, but that's the Buffalo. It was just, it was a yep. fun, it's a fun moment. So, so wait, wait. So just so I understand, Buffalo is just like something that's fun and unexpected. Random. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, What's I'll yours? do mine. So my high is we start getting our first reservations for the plunge. And this is the first time I have actually sold a paid product. Like someone is yeah. putting down their card it. and I see shit like checking up on Stripe. It's so That's funny. That's a drug you, you will never be able to get. It, um, oh my God. It's inc- <laughs> the combination of that with uh, this is the first time I've personally, like Caroline, actually run Facebook ads myself. We already always had an employee at the brew doing it. Right. That is the closest, by the way, to like an adult video game is right. fa- yeah. is using oh, yeah. Facebook ad manager. It's crazy. <laughs> and uh, so, th- yeah, these are dollar reservations. It's literally just for a way, a way to have a good sense of demand. So when we go live with Kickstarter, we know how many people will convert to backing the campaign. And so we got we've gotten, I think, uh, 40 dollar reservation so far and every time it's come in it's felt amazing um and so that's that's the high the low i told you this but we haven't had any running water for 36 hours in hoboken that i've never experienced anything like this and to be honest this experience has made me just like get a glimpse into like actually how tough and shitty it must be for people in the world who don't have constant access to running water and clean water because people have been losing their mind in Hoboken for 36 hours. People, you know, go their entire lives dealing with these issues. But the long story short is, yeah, a PSE&G worker nicked a pipe. It caused a huge water explosion. (laughs) And uh, last night I gave my gave myself my first washcloth bath ever. I felt like I was literally in like revolutionary uh, era. Um, So so that was that. And then my buffalo. This is kind of like a buffalo slash like if I do rosebud thorn, it's my bud Uh, going on my bachelor party this weekend in the Bahamas. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, n- haven't been to the Bahamas since I was there in Atlantis when I was like a little kid. Um, it also had me thinking about, so this is uh, uh, a, a guilty pleasure, but Carly and I watch reality TV a decent amount when we mm-hmm. just want to unwind. We watch The Bachelor. The most recent Bachelor episode was in Baja Mar. And I always wonder, like, what is the business contract there? Like, is Baja Mar actually paying The Bachelor to be marketed or they're just giving them rooms and stuff at cost? And then basically it's free marketing yeah. for Bahamar. So that that's the bud. I love it, dude. We'll have a great time. Thanks, man. I'm excited. Uh, it, it gets together a lot of my I guess by the time friends. this airs, you will have gone already. So everyone can yeah. email Alex and say, hope you had a great bachelor party. Hope you're still engaged. I'm also, I'm also excited just to see my co-founder for Morning Brew in like a personal environment because like we've spent the last yeah. eight years talking every day professionally. Just like yeah. seeing him in a casino and at the beach in Baja Mar will just be a fun experience. Um, yeah, okay. That's an interesting, just a quick aside. I mean, it, the I'm sure you've experienced this with Austin. Like, you know, Nick and I realized at some point we had to like create time for our friendship as we were building a yep. push because, because, you know, it, every time we talk, something about the business would come up, right? It was natural. Nobody meant for it. And it's been interesting now that we're not involved. You know, we sold Ampush. Him and I are just friends now, like literally just friends. We have a couple of joint investments and a couple of like, we have no business talk, very little business talk. And our friendship is kind of like regrowing. And funny enough, Adrian and I, who were friends for 20 years. It's gone the opposite direction. Yeah, we're like, not fr- like we, every time we talk, there's like, oh, what's going on with this person? And how's this happening? Totally. And, and so it's just interesting. It's a good thing to call out for people who work with friends, which is like, 100%. make time for the friendship. Uh, that that's a that's a hundred percent what happened with me with Austin after I stepped out of the CEO role and had a little bit of distance from that and became the chairman. That's actually when I would say Austin and I actually became friends. Before right. that, like I wouldn't have called Austin a best friend. I would have called him like my cousin who I respect and am close with. Right. And it's completely changed in the last year and a half. Um, okay, let's hop into the actual thing. Uh, even though I, I think the early banter there were some good lessons in that. We're going to talk about three things today. We're going to talk about your weekly meetings for Kahani and Growth Assistant and why you've been making changes to them. We're going to talk about Rolex and the luxury watch market uh, and some interesting learnings from that. And then as always, we have a startup AMA where Emily F., uh, Crazy Ones listener, 
gave us a great question that I think a lot of people resonate with around when is the right time to go full-time on your business. So uh, let's hop into the first part. You mentioned to me, I, I'd asked you, like, what is all the shit that's gone on with your businesses in the last week? And you had a ton of great stuff. One of the things that stood out and was the first thing you mentioned was that you redid your weekly meetings for go to market across Kahani and Growth Assistant. Talk about why you're doing that. Like, why did you rework these meetings? Yeah, yeah. I think I think the you know I'll start by saying the the couple things I was even hinting at earlier. I think one is, uh, you know, inertia is the devil of business, right? And you think about the classic big company or the Google thing you were just mentioning, and it's like, oh, they've gotten slow and they've gotten reactive. And I was watching this thing recently where he was like, you know, once you become a big company, a hundred million in revenue, you you just want to protect that revenue. And that's in yep. some ways human, it's like the human tendency to to protect. But I would argue that kind of behavior happens a lot earlier than most people acknowledge. Like you get to a million in revenue, you're like, I don't want to go down from a million. I want to, you know, and so th there's a human nature tendency. And this is kind of like what the whole innovator's dilemma concept is. That book is talks about how if you don't disrupt yourself, right? Like Polaroid is an example, somebody else is going to disrupt you. Yep. And like there's a classic example of Steve Jobs where he was a huge fan of that book and and the iPod was crushing it and he disrupted the iPod with the iPhone. Like he actually cannibalized his own sales. And I bring that up at a high level to relate to it. Like that isn't just a big strategic thing you do. At every level of your organization, it's it's the leader, the CEO, the founder's responsibility to disrupt the way they're doing things, to like, reinvent them to be better and like anytime i see inertia seeping in and and it, i will i will blow it up usually <laughs> it's also a yeah. type 7 thing um but the specific thing that i did was you know we were we were meeting on a regular basis around go to market right and you think about what's go to market it's like marketing say, like actually getting the meetings for sales for B, this is for b2b business then it's uh what are we doing once we get a meeting? Do we actually close the deal? And then once we close the deal, like, do we get them onboarded and does it work? And like growth assistant Kahani are completely different businesses, but in general, those things are pretty common across the two of them, right? And just so people know, because you were talking about like, this happens for big companies, but still early in the earlier days of your business, you should still be thinking about this and kind of having a watchful eye for inertia. How old are Kahani and growth assistant that you're already thinking about? Like, how do you disrupt yourself? Kahani is realistically about a year old and growth assistant is about two years old. Okay. But it's, I, I think it's like, this could happen in a month's time span. Like it, it, there's a, just like what we were talking about with Carolyn, which is like people make a plan on Monday and something could change on Wednesday and they're still doing their plan, even though, even though, you know, something completely changed in the middle of the week. It's a very common issue I see with like people I've an angel invested in and I'm sure everyone's guilty. I'm guilty of it, right? I mean, everyone's guilty of it. You talked about my personal schedule for the long time listeners is like very routinized. Like I have tennis on to like it is a, it, that like regularity is helpful for humans, but it's like, you have to figure out how to flex it up and how to yep. flex it down. Right. And what I would say is, is what I, you know, what I was seeing is over time, we had added various meetings to cover these different things at different times. They, you know, they weren't necessarily, uh, there were gaps between the knowledge and information that I was getting. So like I couldn't lend, end a certain day and know where everything stood and what was like, I needed to prioritize or what needed to be changed and shifted um, and, and in general, like there was, you know, we would follow up on things and we would do stuff, but it wasn't, it, there wasn't like a tightness to it. Like things would fall between the, oh, what happened with that, that, that related conversation? What happened with that relationship? And so there's a few bunch of behaviors. I said, you know, I said, we got to change the way we're doing all this. Okay. So Monday for, you know, I set it up for Kahani first and I helped Adrian set it up for growth assistant, but it's literally the meetings now are 30 minute meetings that cover exactly the order I just set in. So the first meeting is marketing. And the question of marketing is like, how many leads did we say we were going to get? Like, what was in our plan? How many did we get? Like, why? And what did we learn from that? And so, like, I can end that 30-minute session and it was like, oh, that thread didn't do well or our email yep. marketing didn't perform the way we expected to. Okay, so what are we going to do differently this week? And so, okay, now I already have our hands, you know, and then sometimes it's, oh, we got... And so I'll go, okay, cool. We beat the plan on leads, let's just say as an example. We beat it because two emails really performed well. Awesome. Okay, now let me go into the meeting, the sales meetings. Okay, how many outreaches did we do? How many intros were made? How many people responded to our cold outreach? From the leads, how many meetings booked? And all of a sudden you're like, wow, our, our leads to meeting, like why are we getting so many leads but nobody's booking? So that's like a connection you wouldn't otherwise make or you'd randomly make, but now I'll, I'll literally make it five minutes into the second meeting. And immediately I was like, as an example, I, I got the marketing guy. I said, can you rejoin this, this conversation? Like from now on, you're no longer in charge of leads, you're in charge of meetings. 
So yeah. I need like some, because what was happening is this is examples, it was a little bit of a mixed example, but we, there was a, a big drop off. And then you look at it and you go, this guy goes, the salespeople go, well, I'm responsible for the meetings. This guy, I'm responsible for the ease. You go, oh, okay. I see why that's happening. Like nobody's taking totally. accountability for those things getting booked. And then same kind of thing. How many meetings did we say we'd book? How many outreaches have happened? Did the activity take place? what did we learn? Oh, well, let's so you're try basically different... just, You're basically just saying here, you reoriented the first part of the meeting around marketing to understand what is your full funnel. So from the very first touch point of how you potentially get in front of a customer to the end when you're converting them, every step of the way, are you hitting your goals and where are things getting yeah, stuck it, in the process? Yeah, and responsibility shifted so that there was one person clearly responsible, not two. Yep. Which I probably would have taken a month I think that's to such a, out. I think that's such a good lesson, by the way, which is it's so easy to kind of be loose around accountability in the in totally. any point of building a business. At the end of the day, just the rule of thumb you can use is if if no one is accountable, it will not get done. You can just make that. Yeah, that, what we, at Ampush we used it, and I have, I need to rebring it into Gateway X, but we use the concept of Apple's DRI. Have you ever heard of that? No. Directly responsible individual. Oh uh, so like yeah, you that never Apple walk ever, out. There was always one, one person. There's always one DRI. Who's the yeah. DRI? Um, and it's written down. So anyway, then the sales, the sales meeting is a little bit different. That's like, okay, we took this number of meetings, but again, it starts with a metric. So leads in the first one, let's say meetings in the second one. Third one is like how many credit card submits or how many sort of like, you know, people agreed to, to buy the product. But there's also a specific conversation where we start with, and this is a pretty co common thing, but okay, what are all the meetings that were taken and what's the next action for each of them to make sure that they move forward? And it's funny because like I would challenge people who aren't doing this to do it. At first, you're like, oh, that's easy. That's straightforward. A lot of people also, the sales team doesn't like it. They're like, I, I got it, guys. I'm good. You do it. The first two times we did it, we didn't even have all the data together to actually talk about every meeting that had taken place. So then, you know, I was like, okay, well, how are we going to make sure we have the data next week? Well, we're going to pull from the calendar and we're going to pull from HubSpot and we're going to pull from my personal diary. And it's like, so it took us two or three weeks just to make sure we had the right data to be able to make sure we hit on every conversation that took place in, in the organization and like what the next action was. So, well, that is an interesting thing to, to think about. Like that's where there's actually value that can be provided by a meeting that I haven't really thought hard about before is it literally can just be a force function for having the right information. Totally. Yeah. Well, having the right information, but then I think the next part of it is back to that volley I was saying earlier, like, you know, we had a sales guy, he joined the meeting, he goes, Jesse, I have a stupid meeting. Such a stupid. And I'm like, oh, I, I hear you. Let's talk to, okay, what does that company do? Oh, I don't know. Okay. Oh, well, if you knew, do you think I might know, like, might, I might have a tidbit that could help you sell them better. Oh, yeah, actually I could see that, right? Yeah, totally. What's the headcount of that company? And who are, what, what, what organization, like what level are we talking in the organization? Like, so it actually, what happens is very quickly, you start asking a few questions in that sales meeting as you run through it. And people stand up straighter in their seats. They have more information and data. And then the last one is sort of like customer success and onboarding. So there'll be an onboarding part of it, but then also like a who's red, who's yellow, who's green. So who could we be upselling? Who's and again, you go through the list. And and like the other part of it, to your point around the forcing function, is if you want to like, I can be a little intimidating. I don't mean to be intimidating, but I'm direct and I'm you know I'm smart <laughs> and I'm fast. And so like if you're gonna be in that meeting with me and you're not prepared it's gonna not yeah, be, be on your game it's not gonna be very pleasant for you right and i, I won't have to be mean for it to not be pleasant for you i'm i, I don't i'm not trying to be mean to anybody yeah, it'll just be uncomfortable because yeah, you will go, ask so, questions so which, and you won't have the answers yeah so what's the status of such and such account well, i don't know okay but what happens if they turn tomorrow you know and 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 so what happens is the whole team levels up right and so you have everybody starts to so within two hours by the way four 30 minute meetings roughly not to mention now I have all the information. Like I can't leave that, that, that two hours, not knowing where are we weak? Where are we strong? What's happening? Um, and so I've been really excited about it as a, as a thing we've, you know, that's still where I think we're three weeks into the, the various versions. Here's the other cool thing, by the way, Adrian is out this week. She's going to the Philippines and Adrian is your growth assistant CEO. Yeah. And yeah. she goes, can you just, Jesse, can you be substitute teacher? So I joined the meeting and like, it was awesome because everyone knew it was, just, we knew exactly what the conversation was going to be, right? Okay. Here's our numbers were, here's what we did. Here's, and, and it was like, I was able to plug in for her. So in some ways it's actually, it was like scale and leverage from a CEO and a founder standpoint, because once the whole team is doing that, I don't have to be the, you know, it doesn't have to be. Totally. So a few, a few things. One is you, you talked about kind of a, a very key part of, and I wasn't sure if this is, was for Kahani and or growth assistant about like 
having a very clear visibility into the funnel and like marketing and sales, like where's everything out at, but can you just kind of provide a full picture of what did meetings look like before and what are the big changes you made and why? Yeah, I think we'd have a team meeting every week and like we would never have enough time to get into the details of anything. So it would be very yeah. high level. Okay, this is what's going on. Then like there'd be a lot of Slack conversation like, oh, did we follow up with Bob? And then, what about this? Did we have this thing that we need to prep for? And who's onboarding this week again? Oh, somebody went live? Okay, right? Like, and in, in the early days of a startup, if you have that much rigidity that I just said, like it's just, it'll be overkill, I think. Yeah. You could do it, I guess. But then it got just got to the point where clearly... There was so much flying around and then things were dropped. Like the biggest sign to me, and by the way, I'm not an organized, uh, I'm an ENT, like I'm not a J, I'm not a, I am I don't like this stuff. Like I don't actually like doing it and, and, and yeah. owning it, but I know it's so important that like I started seeing stuff fall through the cracks or things would slow down. That was another big one for me. Like a thing that we, we knew should have taken a week was taking three weeks. And so there's all these signs of, of like behaviors and things happening in the business. I said, you know what, we got to, let's get more, more tight and more organized about this. And again, humans are inert uh, naturally. And so uh, it, it's not like everyone just said, yes, sir, Jesse, right away, let's do this. They were like, no, why? That's, that's extra time. Why are, we don't want to become a meeting culture, Jesse. Like there's a lot, a lot of pushback. It's not like it just well, happens. Well, so, so what's your response to that? Because as you were talking about something as simple as like, you understanding how many leads you generated, where they were generated from, how many of those turned into meetings. What I'm saying to myself is like, why do you need a meeting for that? Like, can't you just have an easy visualization of this entire funnel? Like, why do you need the time spent to actually talk about it? Yeah, I don't think you need it. I think I like it. And I think having the volley and then having the accountability and everybody seeing what's going on and the connectivity is valuable. Um, so it... it Again, like I, I, I've learned as I've gotten older, you know, I don't argue for what's right and wrong. It's, it's a waste of time. I could debate because you could tell, you know, someone in the team could argue five. Re I got this. Is how I like it. Just how I like totally. it. It's how I do my work, guys. I got kids. I know. I, I wish I could look at a dashboard, but like I'm, I'm giving them breakfast and taking them to school. So for me, no matter what time has to be blocked on my calendar to do something. So if I think you're going to get value out of it also by hearing my feedback by other people, like, then I think we should do a meeting. Now, if meetings become stupid, like I'm also the first person to look at a meeting the next day and go, guys, I don't think we need this anymore. We already addressed this issue we talked about. So I think you get in the habit of moving things around and nothing, nothing sacred and you're not forcing people to show up to a meeting. You'll be fine. Uh, but I don't, I, it's just preference. It's just what I like. Yep. I think, I think you could run it completely async. That exact thing I said, you could run it totally async if that's just your preference. You. Um, but that's just not my preference. Makes sense. And then two more questions on the topic. The you notice how hard day, that was to argue with, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you again, be like, your preference it's, it's, is different. Jesse. <laughs> it, it's a feel. It's a that's feeling. It's not a what fact. What the conscious and leadership people call unarguable language. It's uh -huh, like, that's actually uh -huh. what it's called because it's literally it's changed my marriage. I mean, just instead of talking, I mean, debating what, whether what, something is right or wrong, or we should or shouldn't do something, we just kind of go like, I don't want to do that. Or I, I mean, I would have to be arguing with why your feelings are wrong. And, yeah. and that's not a rational argument to make. Um, the second is from your experience of tweaking these meetings and for uh, entrepreneurs who are listening, thinking about, okay, what can be the rule in my, in my head of when I finish a meeting, how do I know if it was actually a good successful meeting? Like it was worth the time. What do you look for to happen in this meeting where at the end you have something in your hands that tells you, okay, this was valuable. The, the four hours of cumulative, cumu cumulative human time that was spent here, it was worth it. Yeah, I think, I think the number one thing is action items. So if yep. it's clear that people are going to do something and there's a time and a date and specific attached to it, it was worth it. Because it, what it means is that that wasn't, I mean, maybe it would have happened, but it wouldn't have happened in that p pace and that time period. So if you can only solve for one thing, it's like, what's the action items? Who's the DRI, right? Yep. I think the second one is like, if you got a handful of new ideas or think like something interesting came through there, that's also really, really valuable. That's probably the only way that was going to come, right? Maybe it was in the shower, but realistically that volley again is really valuable. Um, or, and it could be something like, oh, I know it, so they're pitching something, something. Oh yeah. Let's ask them Alex at morning brew, how he would use a growth assistant. And he's going to like, whatever, right? Like something that, you know, is going to improve the likelihood for the success to take place because it's totally. an idea or something new. And then the third thing I'd say is, is there something around, um, <clears throat> like the, a better understanding gained through that time, especially for myself personally. Like if I started the meeting, 
And I was like, wow. I, by the end of that, those two or three meetings, I'm like, I did not realize that thing was getting dropped in between these two people. I did not realize like if anything that I can gain in terms of knowledge and information that helps me see the business more clearly means that I got a lot of value out of that time. Love it. Love it. So it and sounds it isn't like crazy. One thing I, I do want to say, like this is going to be maybe controversial, but like it is not crazy for people who are CEOs and leaders for the organization to serve at their pleasure to make them more effective and better. That's not a crazy thing. Like it's all, Oh, the team. And like, I I'm all about team and growing other people, but, but as the leader, sometimes it is important that maybe the team's a little bit less productive for your benefit because you're ultimately the only person who can see everything that's happening and you're ultimately making most of the decisions, right? And so it's not a crazy thing for people to have to do things. Like a lot of CEOs, they don't want to impose, oh, I don't need you to send me a report. That's going to take you time. Maybe you do. Maybe 10 minutes of you reading something is worth it versus you poking around in Google Analytics, you know? Like yeah. that might be the right thing for the organization. So I just, I want to call that out because I see a lot of like, I don't want to say falsely modest, but almost like incorrectly modest CEO types or leaders who are like, oh, I don't want to trouble the team with it. No, you know, the best thing for the company is that you get information quickly, fast, and in a way that you can digest it so that you can be a better leader and make better decisions. Yeah. I also think, you know, that resonates a lot with me because I think it's, I don't know if this is like a a type seven thing or just a me thing, but a lot of people who are leaders don't like upsetting others or are creating any sort of negative emotion from the people that you're working with. And I think that is a good way to be empathetic, but actually if it's holding you back from being the most effective leader you can be, then you're not really serving yourself or the people that you're working with. Yeah. And, and one interesting thing I've told Adrian this a, a bunch of times and any of the CEOs I've worked with told it to John, I said, nobody knows what it's like to be in that seat. Yep. So if you don't explain, guys, I got six things flying. Any moment you, you're trying to tell me something, realize I have six pings coming from the external world from, you know, and I need your help. I'll say that a lot. I really need your help so that you can give me the first two minutes of what the last conversation we had was because I can't promise you I remember it. Right. I love it. And my first one of my first VPs of HR taught me this. She's like, dude, you got to tell people what your day is like because they don't get it. And then they're just like, well, they're hanging out. They're like, why doesn't Jesse know what I'm doing? And it's like, well, you know, he's got a bazillion things going through his mind. And so he like starting to make not, not people feel sympathy for you, but empathy for you to understand what you're going through and understand what that leadership looks like so that they're helping you be a better version of yourself also. Totally. And I think it's why it also requires you to have deep empathy as a founder or a leader to understand that you can't just assume everyone knows everything and because they don't have full visibility and actually you provide them if you avoid knowledge gaps and you give them the information that they need actually, they will be able to better help you. When we come back, we're going to talk about Rolex, luxury watches, and the lessons you can learn from them. Stay tuned. Let's be real. Business owners can't do everything. There are just too many fires to put out on the daily from managing benefits coverage for employees to navigating intricate payrolls to dealing with compliance penalties. But to level up your biz, you're going to need the confidence to handle all of these challenges. Here's a pro tip. Don't do it alone. ADP's PEO, ADP Total Source, is here to help. As a leading PEO, ADP has seen it all, from helping businesses handle tricky employee situations to managing turnover and compensation. And with up to 53% of small businesses getting sued by their employees every year, ADP Total Source stands with you. They back you with their EPLI policy, and they're the only PEO that stands behind their advice with a legal defense benefit. Terms and conditions apply, but this is a big deal. And the cherry on top, research has shown that businesses that partner with a PEO grow 7 to 9% faster. It's a no-brainer. Partner up with ADP Total Source. Want to see if your business is a good fit for a PEO? Go to adp.com slash the crazy ones to find out. That's adp.com slash the crazy ones. This episode of The Crazy Ones is brought to you by Electric. One thing all business leaders know for sure, security is paramount. To grow with confidence and create your best work, you need to trust your work will stay protected and supported. And Electric is your go-to for IT needs, big, small, and somewhere in between. 
access proactive security standardization across devices, apps, and networks, and rest easy knowing you have lightning fast IT support at your service. But that's not all. If you complete a qualified meeting with Electric, they will send you a free pair of AirPods Pro. To qualify, you must be an IT decision maker at a US-based company with 10 to 500 employees. Get started at electric.ai slash crazy ones. That's electric.ai slash crazy ones. And we are back to the show. Uh, just had a great conversation about how to make meetings effective as a startup, which as unsexy of a topic as it sounds, time is the most limited resource you have. And so being really intentional about how you run your meetings is wildly important. Next topic up. We're talking about Rolex. So Jesse, the context here is um, I've always been into watches. Uh, I wear, on a daily basis, I wear my Apple watch, um, but I would say I have three or four nice watches. Two of them are my dad's that after he passed, I took from him. It was his work watch. And also when he when it was his first Father's Day ever, my gift to him as a one-year-old was uh, a tag that he wore uh, throughout his life. And so that's actually the one I wear most frequently. I love it. But it's funny. I always planned after selling the brew to uh, to get a really nice watch. And I didn't because the waiting time was so long. I got kind of bored of <laughs> waiting for so long. Right. But finally, I'm going to get, you know, the nice uh, luxury watch that I've wanted. Um, my fiance was incredibly generous. And for my 30th birthday and for our wedding, she's getting me a Rolex. Um, nice. And so you got the I'm Roly? really, ex I'm getting a Rolly. And the reason I went deep into just the history of Rolex is because, so we went to uh, the Short Hills Mall um, over the weekend and it is so fascinating the process you go through to try to procure a Rolex. We get to the store right when the mall opens. There is literally uh, kind of like a club. There's like the the red uh, carpet with like the thing that the bouncer lifts up to let you inside of. There's two <laughs> guards outside of there in suits that say, welcome to Rolex. They lift it up. We go inside. There's a personal shopper who meets you. So we met our personal shopper. They bring you to the back of the store where these like big velvet banquettes and they uh, ask you what you're interested in, what the occasion is, because Rolex's whole thing is it's tying to big moments in your life, big accomplishments in your life. Mm. So I picked out the watch that I want. It's this uh, silver date just uh, very like timeless, simple Rolex. And at the end. Carly and I were talking as she the the woman was in the back and Carly was like, so do we get this now? Like, how does this work? I was like, yeah, I assume so. I assume we just buy it now and that's it. The lady comes back and we're and we're like, so how do we go about getting this now? And she's like, no, 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 no. You don't get this watch now. You're going to fill out this piece of paper with your name, your number, your email. And I believe for this model you're looking for, you are first on the list. There was another model you're looking for where you're fourth on the list. Here's how it works. We are a Rolex authorized dealer. We have no idea when we are going to get your watch. Rolex doesn't tell us when they send us shipments. We it. just on random days have a guy from UPS who brings in a box from Rolex. We don't know what models we're going to get. On the day where we get a shipment that happens to have your model, if you're first on the list, we'll call you up and you'll get it. And by the way, it could take up to a year. So we can't make any promises on timing. We can't promise that you're going to have it for your wedding. So that's how the process went. Have you, by the way, have you ever gotten a luxury watch? Like, did you ever have, have to go yeah, through yeah. this? Did you have to go through this process or no? I mean, you, you're going retail. We got to we talk offline about it. you don't have to go retail. Correct. Like you could buy secondhand, you're saying? Not secondhand, but there's like dealers who like there's there's webs. I mean, there's the whole there's the whole ecosystem around this that if you to really wanted that model, we could get you that model. That's what the total, awesome. Totally. But I will say that I'm also like very intent on buying it at MSRP. Yeah, and yeah sure, so, sure, sure. And so I don't want to buy 2X the price of the watch. Anyway, that's how the process went down. And so I went down the rabbit hole of the history of Rolex. And I just want to quickly tell you about it. And then we can talk about the lessons learned from this business. So Rolex has been around since 1905. This guy, Hans Wilsdorf, uh, founded a company in 1905 called Wilsdorf and Davis. He founded with this guy, Alfred Davis, who is his brother-in-law. 
Alfred Davis basically fronted all of the money for Rolex uh, because at the time Hans was a 24 year old orphan. He, he had lost both of his parents when he was 12 and he'd become obsessed with watches. Now, everything about the early days of Rolex is what I would consider to be contrarian. Wrist watches were not a thing. Like everyone loves wearing watches on the wrist today. It was all about pocket watches. And Hans, like early Babe Ruth pointing to center field call was my personal opinion is that pocket watches will almost completely disappear and that wrist watches will replace them definitively. That was the bet he took. Wow. But interestingly, wrist watches only became a thing during World War I when soldiers literally started strapping pocket watches to their wrists because they didn't want to be reaching for their pocket while you're getting shot at right, in right. like, you know, in battle. The other interesting thing is it was named Rolex in 1908 because a big concern of Hans's was that other watch companies had very like Swiss French names that could be hard to pronounce like Audemars Piget. Right. And he was like, I want a name that isn't in a certain language that the American market won't be turned off because the pronunciation is frustrating. Right. The other like rumor about it is that Rolex is an onomatopoeia. So it's the sound that a watch makes when you actually wind it is Rolex. I don't know if that's actually a thing. I like that. And then a few other quick pieces. The business has been a nonprofit since 1945. So since really? 1945, it's yeah, it's a it's a nonprofit. It's the Hans Wilsdorf Foundation. Huh. It's still privately owned by the family. Uh, their financials have never been shared. There's just murmurs about how much they make, and they're one of the only watch companies that's private. Most of these watch companies are part of conglomerates like the Swatch Group. Um, and the other really interesting thing about the business is. Rolex has always leaned into using ambassadors as a tool for marketing since the early days. So one of their earliest forms of like viral ambassador marketing was Rolex invented the first waterproof wristwatch. So their case is called the Oyster case, right? Oyster mm -hmm. closed, sh sealed shut. When they invented this case, they had this woman, Mercedes Gleitz, swim the English Channel for 10 hours with Rolex. And then after swimming it for 10 hours, she showed that there was zero damage and they took out a full page ad in the newspaper to highlight the achievement. Wow. And one final thing I'll say, and then we can talk about like the luxury market, what you think about it is I was listening to Ben Clymer, the, the founder of Hodinkee, talk about the history of Rolex. And one interesting thing he said is in general, there are two types of companies. There are companies that when you learn more about them, you like them less. And there are companies that when you learn more about them, you like them more. And Rolex is one of those that you like more and more as you learn about them. And honestly, from doing this research, it wants it makes me want to pay Rolex for this watch because I respect what they do so much. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the quick history. Uh, I can talk about the lessons I've learned in a second, but any reactions or thoughts on like the luxury market? No, I, I think the... <clears throat> the biggest thing, especially when we think about building companies and businesses, what I like about these luxury brands and I think why they're so successful is they're the opposite of venture funded companies. Yep. You know, they, they cannot force growth. It by def Literally, by definition, if they force growth, they will stop being a luxury brand. And there's obviously the famous stories about Bernard Assault uh, and LVMH. And, you know, he realized that early on. So he had to like buy other brands because you cannot force you can't go just multiply the number of SKUs in order to grow. And so I think what I like about them is I think they build great businesses over a long period of time because they're they're basically profitable in the beginning and and they take their time to grow and scale. Um, that's one thought. I, I think the other one is, you know, one of my favorite books we've talked about is Influence by Robert Cialdani. Yeah, he talks about I still haven't read it. I need to. Well, I mean, it, it inherently builds in scarcity, which is like one of the top human manipulative you know psychological tactics yeah. uh and it builds other ones in like authority like it, you know if you read that book you're gonna go oh yeah they like have literally ingrained into their business model these sort of marketing and psychological tactics i mean your whole example is perfect right i mean you walked it like you felt it felt oh, authoritative wild. felt important and the second i get the watch it's going to feel even more of a cathartic of release because i had to wait months for it totally totally and uh um, and I've heard, I've heard even like, you know, Ferraris, for example, and I think Artemar PJs, you can't even buy one. Nope. Like you, you're like, you have to have bought previous you models have to have to bought qualify. previously to get the next uh, opportunity. 
Yeah. And so I mean, there you go, right? So I think they naturally build in these mechanisms. And then obviously the way they solve for it is they have insane margins, right? So the business model sort of works, but it's a it's definitely a long game. And I, I like that it reinforces the long game. 100%. By the way, the, the rumor, just so people have some semblance of the financials, the rumor is that Rolex makes a million watches a year. The average uh, price point wholesale that they sell to their dealers is 7,000. So you're talking about $7 billion in revenue a year. And that's probably the low estimate. A few lessons that I took from reading the story. The first is obsession with excellence. Like there are very few businesses that truly over the course of a hundred years show that they are obsessed with ex- excellence. And just a few examples of that. In the 1990s, uh, Rolex fully verticalized their business. They went from 27 suppliers to four. They make the full product from soup to nuts now. They have two Nobel Prize winning scientists on staff, and they literally invent machines within their business that no one in the world uses. The craziest story is about they invented a machine that sorts through all of the diamonds and stones that suppliers send them throughout the world to see which ones are fake. They said that only one in every 10 million stones that they receive from their suppliers is fake, yet they wow. invented a machine to find that one because they are not willing to concede on the one that ends up in their customers' watches. The second lesson is that outsourcing things you're not exceptional at is something they've always done. They make watches. They don't sell watches. There is one Rolex store in the world. Other than that, they have authorized dealers that sell these things. They could, if they wanted to, make 20 to 40% more than the wholesale price they charge if they went further down you know, the value chain and had stores, but they're choosing to just do what they're great at, which is make watches. The third is staying true to your brand for a long time. So 1970s was a crisis for the watch industry. It's when quartz movements are created. So Japanese brand Seiko created, or Seiko created, battery powered watches for the first time. And not only were they cheaper, they were 10x more precise in terms Mm -hmm. of telling time. And so during this time, most Swiss watch brands almost went bankrupt. It's when there was a full consolidation in conglomerates. Rolex stayed true to itself. It didn't try to go into courts. It went all in and it basically just pivoted how it marketed itself. It went from marketing itself as the best, most precise time telling watch for function to focus on luxury. And that's when it switched to being a luxury brand. Uh, The last lesson goes back to exclusivity, which is I think there are four things that they did to create exclusivity. Price point, secrecy, delayed gratification, and intentionality of who the brand aligns with. Price point starts at $7,000. That's the lowest. And the most expensive Rolex sold ever was in 2017. They sold uh, a Paul Newman watch for $17.8 million at auction. The... Second is secrecy. Uh, Their building in Switzerland where they make their watches is 11 floors, but you can only see five of them because six of the floors are underground because they want to make it look smaller than they actually are. The third is delayed gratification. Just talk about my experience with the Rolex store or when we sold the brew, I try to get a different Rolex. And it was to your point, one of those models where you have to have previous Rolexes. I literally couldn't get the watch. I waited for six months, couldn't get it. And then I just lost hope. And the final is intentionality of what or who the brand aligns with. They've only ever worked with the best. Roger Federer, they've worked with his entire career. Yo-Yo Ma, uh, the the cellist, or the best events. They only work with the golf majors, not other golf tournaments. They only work with Wimbledon in the US Open, not not other tournaments as well. So, so many great lessons to learn from Rolex. Uh, let's uh, turn to Startup AMA. Some things just leave you guessing, like why are yawns contagious? But you know who doesn't leave you guessing? MailChimp. MailChimp analyzes data points from billions of emails to offer up personalized recommendations to help you improve areas like email content and audience targeting. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash guesswork. That's MailChimp.com slash guesswork. Okay, everyone, it is time for Startup AMA, and we have an awesome question from a Crazy Ones listener, Emily Fu, who asked us, when is the right time to go full-time on your business? And I was actually speaking on a panel this past week with a lot of early-stage entrepreneurs, and I got that question over and over again. So... How did you think about when to take the plunge into your various businesses? 
This is a tough one. I mean, you know what I'm going to say, which is like, I think it's different for everyone. Yep. And that's like, oh, I just hate, I hate some of this generic advice. Like I tried, I mean, I had a DJing business in high school. I had a t-shirt business in college. Me and, and the Ampush co-founders, Chris and Nick started four companies in college. And we would literally, our goal was to drop out. We were like, we need the thing to get to enough traction that we can drop out. So we were there. They were kind of side hustles. While I was at Goldman, I did one that was a side hustle. What was I, it? From, it, was, it was so stupid. The, uh, <laughs> do you remember the uh, F My Life websites that started popping up? You, you might uh, be young. I, I've heard of FML, but no, I, I haven't. So there was like I, this craze in the 2008, nine thing. It was like pre-mobile kind of and Twitter, but like basically they were like UGC sites where people would post. There was one called text from last night. That was like, you would post like a funny text from last night without yep. the context. And then it would like, they would feature it and they just became funny content. So the, the one that blew up the most was called F my life, which was just like my airplane is stuck on the runway and I had to take a poop and it ended up in my pants. F my <laughs> life, right. Like people would yeah, share it's, stuff It's just like venting. That. It was just like UGC yeah. venting. And then somebody started creating like a, my life is, and I forgot the first one, uh, but we, ba I still own them funny enough. Like we basically bought all these domains of like, my life is finance. My life is black. My life is. And so the idea was, oh, there's going to be all these sites where people will say like, my life is seek. Like, oh, my hairspray ran out this morning before a big meeting. Yep. Like, so my beard's all messed up. My life is seek. Like, oh, you know, like, and so it, the idea was to build a network of these sites to like, get them to blow up and we were doing that as well at like goldman sachs by day like weird corny media thing at night um that that is hilarious it kind of reminds me of uh like today there's like wall street confessions which is all these yeah, like anonymous yeah, very similar idea yeah same um, thing but for me personally i just i i'm and the same thing with gateway like i'm not good at side hustling i am like one of these people who who needs to have my energy when i wake up in the morning i'm focused i'm like i'm thinking i'm intense and like, you can't, I could not have an intense job. Like now, again, in my experience, I had these very intense jobs, right? My, my days were 12 plus hours. I had to pay attention to stuff because stocks were trading. Like, so I just, I didn't have the ability to mentally pull away from those things. Um, and so that, that's just my experience. Like, I think it's, I think you, I would tell people, most people, if that's similar, like you go give yourself two years, quit everything, go all in and make it work. And I think that that sets you up for more success around entrepreneurial ventures. With that said, I've seen plenty of my friends who either don't have as demanding jobs. Like they really do a side hustle. They're like, they get online at night, they work for five hours, they, and then they get it to a certain point of traction where like I, I interviewed the founder of uh, uh, supply. It's like the shaving business. And he's like, yeah, like as soon as it got to the amount of profit that replaced my salary, like that's when I jumped. So he had a very, specific metrics. So anyway, that's my experience with it. But well, uh, j just on that note, when you went and started Ampush, just so I remember the timeline, were you still at Goldman or did you leave Goldman to start Ampush? I left Goldman to start Ampush. And so you, you took like a full leap, like you just got rid of your salary, figured out the business. You weren't, you didn't have revenue coming in from Ampush yet. No. Ampush didn't yeah. exist. Yeah. We left, we move to California. What should we start? Talk to people. And we're like, you know, we puttered around for a little while. I did go live with my parents at 25, you know, just to keep my costs down in that first year. But yeah, there was no business whatsoever. Yeah. I, th I think it's a good contrast to provide just like how you and I approached it, because I actually do think in general, you're a more risk loving individual than I am in life. I, I actually think I, I am more risk averse. And so for me, the way, and maybe it's just because of how things shook out with Morning Brew, but I would say that I don't believe like taking these leap leaps of faith. One, I think leap of faith implies that like you aren't thoughtful about the decision you're making, but I also think you can make certain pro progress or hit milestones that make it more like you're like stepping across, uh, you know, like the the river versus leaping. Sure. With, with Morning Brew, just to provide kind of exact numbers. I went and joined Morgan Stanley uh, in 2015, and when I joined, we had uh, 30,000 subscribers. I said that I would leave Morgan Stanley. I promised myself I would leave Morgan Stanley if we get to 100,000 subscribers for Morning Brew. I ended up leaving when we had 70,000 subscribers, so I didn't keep my word to myself, 
Um, but there was a natural point at which I had to make a decision because Austin had to decide whether he was going to go into banking or not. And we hadn't made a dollar up to that point. Yeah, I was going to say, did, were you generating any revenue? No, zero, zero revenue. But and we had did done, you know how you were going to make money? We knew it was going to be advertising. We knew we, we okay. weren't going to charge for this product. And we had done some research into like the skim, how much money were they making per subscriber, previous like OG newsletters like Daily Candy. So we had we had a good sense for how much we thought we could make, but we hadn't monetized at all. For me, I used like a few mental frameworks to make the decision. And as I say these frameworks, by the way, like it sounds very clean, but it was eight months of me feeling incredibly stressed, basically venting to my mom every day after work, like what am I going to do? Right. The first thing I thought about is I I thought of things in terms of regret. Like what am I going to regret most? Would I more regret staying at Morgan Stanley and watching someone else build something that resembles Morning Brew because they were willing to take the time to do it? Or would I more regret going doing Morning Brew it fails. I can't get my job back at Morgan Stanley and I have to figure it out. And right. when I thought about that, it was like such an obvious answer. I would way more yeah. regret, watch someone build the thing. The second way I thought about it was, what's the worst case scenario? And I was like, the worst case scenario is what I just described, which is I leave Morgan Stanley. We're building the brew for six months. We can't find a way to monetize it. We have to shut it down. If that happens, what options do I have? I was like, maybe one, I can go back to Morgan Stanley if I haven't burned my bridges and I have this new interesting experience. Two, could be a good business school story. Three, I'm in, you know, you were in San Francisco. I was in New York. Maybe I've made good connections to start another business or join a startup. Four, leverage my family network. And I got down the list of like four or five options. And I was like, right. if if none of these are options, it's actually, it has nothing to do with Morning Brew. It has to do with me not keeping options open in life. And then the third and final way I looked at it was, you know, we've talked a little bit about it on the show, was my dad passing away was like the big perspective changer in my life. And it just made me realize that like, I was getting so much energy in the hours of 8 to 12 a.m. after work on Morning Brew. I was not getting energy from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Why am I doing this if I know every day is a gift to me? Why am I not spending time how I want to spend it? Plus, I knew that like I was at a point in my life where I had the least amount of obligation and it would only get harder every additional year right. of life to actually leave and do the thing. So those were the three things what, that what I thought you, about. What did you do? I think funny enough, so I'll go two places. What, funny enough, you and I thought about the decision exactly the same way. Yeah. I just didn't have an idea. So I was just like, hey, I gave two years of my life to this consulting business and two years to this finance company. I, I you know, And I'd set myself up, but basically minimize my downside. And we've talked about that. Like, I had a lot of options to go back into something or go to business school or whatever. And yep. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with setting yourself up that way. And in fact, like I think to your point, I like from a risk averse perspective, like I felt the worst thing I would do is lose a couple of years in my career relative to other people. Yep. Um, but I did think it was important to commit for two years without any distractions. We really used to joke, like, no one's allowed to take the GMAT. Like, we have no contingencies. We're going to go do this. But one question I have for you that I just had never figured out and I think would be valuable is, like, how did you actually run the business when you had a job? Like, what was your actual schedule? What did you? When did you do what? Because that was where I my struggle was always, like, you know, I'd, I'd wake up, yeah, get, go to work. I'd get home at eight o'clock. Right. And, yep. and then maybe I'd want to eat and chill and watch some TV. And then it's 10 o'clock at night. And like, what am I going to do? And so how did you actually work on this business during, during work? Yeah. So actually I would say one of the, the early challenges of the business, which I think ended up being a blessing because it prevented me from spending time on writing the thing is when I joined Morgan Stanley any financial services firm has this thing called an OBI, outside business interest, where if you're working on something outside of the bank, you have to declare it. And so I declared Morning Brew as an outside business interest. And basically what compliance said was, hey, you can stay involved with this thing, but you can't write it because we worry that you're going to be inside trading through your newsletter. And so when that happened, I just knew that I couldn't touch the content anymore. And so the way we had it set up, up until we hired our first writer, is college students who were readers of Morning Brew, they were on a schedule of contributing to the newsletter. They were writers for the newsletter. They were not paid. They were doing it to build up their resume and get their words in front of thousands of people. And then some of the earliest equity we gave were to two editors. 
We had one guy who who uh, managed the contributors at did all the grammatical editing. I think we gave him a point of equity. And then uh, we had a voice editor who was the guy who came in after and made the shit funny. I think we gave him a point of equity also. And like those were the people. So that was the writing process. So I didn't touch that. So I you were just... like more of a facilitator then. That's so as you... a facilitator, I was checking in with the editor every day. I spent my time focusing on growth uh, during that year I was at Morgan Stanley. What is every way we could expand our ambassador program, get people to sign up? And I would say How'd in that year- How'd you grow year, it? Like what were, the, what were you actually doing? Yeah. And the honestly, emailing... we, could, we could do a whole episode on this, but one was uh, our college ambassador program. We expanded it to a point where we had 300 ambassadors at 70 schools and we were getting 25,000 emails per semester doing that and we could do a whole episode about how to run a good college ambassador program the the other was now that i was working at a bank a big thing i was doing was getting in touch with hr managers to uh blast to their listservs at work a great resource for their financial services employees to read so i was trying to leverage that by the way uh that's one of the ways that i ended up getting in a lot of trouble with morgan stanley because the long story short is the guy in compliance who was supposed to accept my outside business interest he got fired two months after we had that conversation. There was a huge riff at Morgan Stanley. 25% of my division got fired. He was one of those people. So when I hit up HR to say, hey, can you let every Morning Brew employee know about, uh, sorry, Morgan Stanley employee know about Morning Brew, they were like, Alex, you've been operating without an accepted outside business interest for a long time. <laughs> this, this is sketchy as hell. I ended up having to meet with Morgan Stanley in-house counsel. Oh and it God. started with them saying, Alex, we are representing Morgan Stanley, not you. And you can't tell anyone, your family or who you work with about this conversation. Oh and that God. was kind of like the, the the straw that broke the camel's neck that caused me to leave, leave the firm. <laughs> it's wild. So um, yeah, all in all, I think to the first thing you said, it is a very personal decision. But I think the similarities in what we just described is we were actually very thoughtful about it. We did a lot of things to mitigate the risk. And even though maybe there's the perception of your leap that you made was a bigger leap than mine because I had a business that had some semblance of foundation, I think you had calculated for all of those things and how long you were going to take this risk and you knew you had options if it didn't work out. Yeah, I think to me, it's almost like, do you, do you, is it maybe a simplification is like, you also jumped without having any money coming in the door. I mean, you had more totally. momentum, obviously, but- to me, it's like, is there money coming in the door that's going to offset your expenses? That's one version of it. Or is there just like, have you de-risked yourself enough that you're willing to take the jump and take some risk and take the time? Because you, yours could have been a false risk. I mean, yours could have been more dangerous in some ways, right? Like, like you totally. thought you had something going and then people stopped subscribing. Yeah, it could have been a false positive. Sell. Yeah, totally. 100%. Um, uh, well, good. Lo love it. Well, great question from Emily Fu. Um, and also, thank you to, again, all of our listeners who wrote in, the ones we called out earlier, or earlier Eliza S., Jackson F., and Erica P. Remember to shoot us an email at thecrazyones at morningbrew.com if you have any questions you want us to answer in a future startup AMA, or if you just want to get a shout out at the top of a future episode, shoot us an email and then keep listening to see if you get a shout out. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll catch you next episode. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of The Crazy Ones. If you're an entrepreneur or a builder and want more great startup content, make sure to subscribe on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts.